Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And now, as Jeremy has been praying, and Lord, we ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us ears to hear your Spirit, Lord. Meet us in our lives now, that we will walk out of here, Lord, hearing from you something new. Not, not new doctrine, but something new for our lives today that we, we need from you to be able to be strengthened, to move forward in this, in this life until we come to a point where we're in eternity with you forever. So Lord, we just, we're, we're almost on our knees begging you to meet us here tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, yeah, last week uh, we were supposed to do all of chapter 18. We ended up doing only half. Uh, so we're going to finish that up this week uh, with reading verses 17 through 30. And last week we talked about a couple different situations or scenarios that David was in. Uh, last week was pretty cool. He, we saw David going through a couple different things like one being um, he was being praised. You know, everybody was pumping David up. It was a cool thing. Uh, but the Bible tells us that he behaved himself wisely. And then the other thing was he was in a situation where now Saul was throwing the javelin at him. But the Bible tells us that even in that he behaved himself wisely. So last week we really got to see what it means to, to be somebody who is consistent in your walk with God. Somebody who is not like a roller coaster ride Christian, you know, where one day you're all fired up, the next day you're all gloom and doom. And we saw in David the character that I think we all want to possess eventually, and that is to just be on a consistent uh, walk with God, where we're not allowing situations, whether they be good or whether they be bad, to cause us to freak out, you know, or cause us to get into a place where we're, we're blowing our witness, so to speak, you know, or where we're sort of just like, like we mentioned last week about the book of Revelation, you know, when Jesus walking among the lampstands where he's telling them, hey, if you don't change right now, I'm going to snuff you out. And we don't want that to be something that we're, we're being spoken to in our lives. We want to be able to say that, hey, I got my walk with God, man. Good times, like Paul says, in bad times, I know who I am. Before Christ, I'm forgiven. I'm a sinner, but yet he even set me free and forgave me of my sins, you know, even in my sin. He said, I, I, I died for you, and and by receiving me, you're forgiven. And so we want to be able to walk in that victory, you know, walk in that, that co consistent relationship with him. And that's a challenge, man, for a lot of Christians today. Yeah, the up and down of Christianity, you know, the, the coming and going type of Christianity where your emotions are dictating your relationship or your, your circumstance, rather, is dictating your relationship with the Lord. We got to become men. We got to become Christians. You are saying, Lord, help me to not let my circumstances dictate my relationship with you. That's the kind of Christian I want to be. I think that's the kind of Christian we all want to be. Where we have a walk with the Lord. That's solid, man. Where you're standing in the victory of God. You're standing in the victory of Christ. That's what I think we all want. And we saw David last week kind of portraying that. And it was awesome. And so now, kind of, we're going to see a, a different situation that... Uh, it's similar in some ways, but one that involves the enemy against David here. But we're going to see the enemy, how, how not only the enemy is a game player, you know. And, and one big thing that really, okay, we could be having a good time in our lives with God and we could be having a bad times. But what about change? What about those transition periods in our lives where now things are changing? And, and if you're a Christian, a, a, a solid one, or one that has really confessed before the Lord, then you better believe that you're going to be experiencing change in your life. And I think, for the most part, change could drive a lot of people weird. Any kind of change, whatever that kind of change might be, whether it's a change in your marriage, a change in your job situation, a change at, at whatever level of change that you, you know what I'm talking about, change can really do a number on people, man. It's weird because the enemy uses change. It, even though we know at the same time the Bible teaches us that God uses change because we've seen the Lord intervene and, and intermingle in so many lives of the, of the people we read about in Scripture, and he does it with change, doesn't he? You remember the children of Israel? I mean, he brought them to a serious change. He said, you guys have not been following after me. 
He tells the children of Israel, because of that, because you've been doing whatever you want to do in your life, I mean, you've been walking on a, a, a weird relationship. They were some, you guys know the story in Jeremiah. Some of them were, he says, you're, you're, you're worshiping with your mouth. You're able to say, oh, I know God and I love God. But he says to them, your hearts are far from me. And so because when this happened in their lives, he caused about a change. And he caused them to go into a captivity, a bondage. One where they were going to go into a new land, a foreign land, unknown to them. And I don't know about you guys. I know what that's like. <laughs> And I know a lot of you guys do too. What it is when God begins to move in your life and begin to bring you into a place that you don't know. It's unknown to you. And I hate it. <laughs> it's hard, man, being in a place where you don't know. I've never been here. What is, what's going on here? I don't like this cover. I don't like this house. I don't like this apartment. You know, some of you, I don't like this hotel. It gets even down there, you know what I mean? And, and, and you, you're experiencing change. And, and God uses it, but at the same time, the enemy comes in, too, in those times of change and wants to cause you to believe that you're getting messed up and it's all your fault and nothing's going to ever get better. And so we're going to see a little bit about how the enemy works in that, but I want to kind of read the scripture that <coughs> we read a, a couple weeks ago. It's going to kind of set our stage. It's in chapter 17, verse 25. Chapter 17, verse 25. Just a couple, just a page over. It says... And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel he has come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. Now you guys remember we're talking about Goliath. And where they were all the guys were talking amongst each other, saying, Oh, hey, Saul said, whoever whacks this guy out, he gets all this stuff. His house gets free from taxes. And he gets to marry the king's daughter. This is, this is Saul's sort of reward that he was offering to anybody who was going to kill Goliath. It was, the, it was the sort of, this is what you get if you do it. And look at what verse 26 says. And David heard that. We remember we went over this. He spake to the men that stood by him saying, What shall be done to the man that killed the Philistine and take away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? See, David heard that. He's like, that sounds good to me. Being married to the king's daughter, getting free from taxes, and getting all these great riches. I can do this. This, this Philistine, he ain't got nothing on me. And so, and then we know the story. David goes down there. He, he hits him with the stone. The Philistine, the giant dies. David cuts his head off with a sword. And now, that tells us by, by nature of Saul's reward... David should have immediately inherited that what Saul, the king, had spoke. Because whatever the king speaks is what the king says. Signet ring signified. You know, it's boom. That's what I said. If, if this is what happens, this is what you get. But David, when he killed them, all of a sudden, we're going to see something. How Saul's mindset is. We already know kind of Saul's mindset. His mindset's weird. He's unstable. He's, he's depressed one day. He's, he's loving David. Now all of a sudden he hates David. He's trying to kill him. And so the king now is sort of a, a, a type of the enemy here. Saul is a type of the enemy, the spiritual enemy that we all are up against, and, and the biblical enemy per se as, as whole in context. He's a type of the enemy. And so he's saying to David, this is what you should have got, but now we're about to see uh, what really happens here. And look at the start in verse 17. So he says, so Saul said to David, behold, my elder daughter Mary, her will I give thee to wife. See, now he should have ended it at that. Here you go. You deserve this. This is rightfully yours. She, you, you, you won. You killed the giant. That was a, not only was there no man here in Israel that would do it, but you did it, David. And so you get the reward. You have this coming. She belongs to you. Interesting how, how an attachment we can sometimes get when we think we deserve something, or when we think something belongs to us. See, I think there's a bigger, there's gonna be a bigger message that we're gonna see within tonight's story. And, because all of these things can really draw the flesh to come to some conclusion. And that is, David could have easily said, wait, stop right there, Saul, that belongs to me. All right, here comes my reward for killing the giant. But look at what Saul says. He says, well, I'm gonna add something to that. He says, now be, only be thou, 
valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. See, we already know Saul's mindset. He wants to kill David. But now here he goes again, using something totally different, using a different kind of ploy here because he wants David killed. So he says, oh, fight the Lord's battles for me, David. You know, I'm going to give you my daughter, Mira, but now, but be valid for me. Fight the Lord's battles. It's so funny how the enemy wants to introduce to us when he's ready, getting ready to bring change in your life or when, he's get, when, when the enemy's preparing himself like that lion that the Bible says he is, waiting there to destroy you. He, starts to, he wants to prep you for the final, the final attack. And that's what he's doing for, for David here. And he's saying, fight the Lord's battles. Fight the Lord's battles, you know. Get involved in ministry. Be, be a part of what God's doing. And so then look at Saul says, to finish it off, for Saul said, and here's where, where we get the revelation here where, where he's revealed. Saul said, let not my hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. So Saul now, instead of just giving him the daughter, as he should have, that was rightfully coming to David, he has another plan, here. He, another plan, another plot. He's saying, you know what? I want this kid dead. I want David killed. But maybe I can use this reward, my daughter. Maybe I can use this to get him killed. Maybe I can, I can cover my actual plan. See, again, this goes back to so many... So many accounts that we read in the Old Testament. Satan is so busy about trying to bring something in our lives that from the outside does not look like what it really is behind in his motive and his intention. That's where we get caught off guard. That's where the Bible says to us so much about being in the spirit, being in prayer, being on your guard, being standing strong. Because the enemy is going to continually bring things to us in our lives that are hard to identify as his plot. How many times has so many of us in this room have been caught in that web? Oh, I know she's a god, man. Look at how hot, look at how great she looks. This is going to be perfect. She even has a, a not of this world t-shirt. Man, this is going to be good. I'm going to marry her next week. What would you guys meet? Yesterday. It's awesome. It's a god, though. Trust me. And all of a sudden, we're getting caught up in that web. Things where, where the enemy's bringing it to us, and from the outside, it looks like, okay, this is what I have coming. This is a part of fighting the battles for God. This is part of my reward. This is a part of my inheritance, if you will, in God, in Christ. And the enemy wants to pose these things to us to, for us to accept it. But behind it, behind these things, if you're not sensitive, to the Spirit of God, if you're not filled with the Lord, if you're not in prayer constantly, you know, and this is where, where we talk about this, the, the real issues of prayer. How, how much of us spend enough time in prayer? How much of us are, are really saying, you know, I need to be before the Lord about my day, about my circumstances, about my life, more than I am about doing it. But how hard is that, you know? It's like I was talking with the guys earlier, and it's like, if I see somebody get hit by a, a, a truck out in the street out here, you know, and the dude, the body just goes flying and everything, I'm probably not going to fall on my knees and pray for that person. I'm more than likely to roll over there. I'm going to do CPR. I'm going to try to help this person. It's in our natural ability to want to do things like with our hands. We got to always be involved, and I think that's why the enemy poses this this sort of Christianity when it comes to prayer. Oh, be busy about serving God versus being busy about talking to Him. See, it's one thing to be before the Lord, discussing your life with him, everything that's going on in your life, before the one who can change it. God is the only person who can actually reach down from heaven and intervene in your life. But how much are we actually spending time before him introducing to God and discussing to him these things in our lives? But the enemy here, he's saying now, Saul's showing us now the reader that he has a different intention. His intention is to keep his hands clean. He's like, I want to kill but, hey, maybe I don't have to do it. Maybe I can get through him marrying my daughter and becoming my son-in-law. The Philistines will know to wipe this guy out first because he can possibly have reigns later on in the future for Israel. Kill him. <laughs> and maybe Saul doesn't have to do anything. And he uses these, these, these situations. Verse 18. And David, though, look at his reaction. David said unto Saul, Who am I? And what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? 
You know, a lot of times we read scriptures like that. And we go, well, David's just playing out dumb. He just doesn't even know what's going on. Look at him. He's just, he's just clueless in the situation. And a lot of times when, when we see brothers who are walking alongside us with our relationships with the Lord, and you've got a brother who's just completely in love with Jesus. Oh, man, don't worry, man. We just need to pray about these things. Oh, we just need to read the word together. Let's just, actually, let's just hold hands together in a circle and pray. And you and what? Hold hands in a circle and pray all that. This young, dumb Christian. No, bro, this is how you got to do it. And a lot of times, you know, you see someone who's on fire for the Lord, and they're so excited about the simplicity of, of being able to receive Jesus and being forgiven, and that they're just moving in there. See, we have, to, we have to make sure that we aren't so caught up in our in intellectualism with God that we forget the simple truths of what the Bible teaches us. Or else you get caught into being one of those analytical Christians, you know, wow, you know, and, and, and this is a serious matter because I know many today, personally, who the enemy is using their, their intellect to deceive them and get them caught up and, and they're splitting and leaving the church because they're going to other places where they think this is where I belong. Taking the simple truths of the word of God and, and, and using, you know, intellect and, and different debates and different uh, doctrines and all these different things to try to say this is what it is. Just because you can get one answer out of it. There's nothing wrong with resting in the fact that you don't know. And that's something I think most pastors who have, were, that sat under Chuck Smith always said about him was there was nothing wrong to him without not having an answer. It's like, hey, I, I, I'm okay, I don't know. But I'll know one day <laughs> when I'm in heaven with God, I'll know the answer to that. Oh, but sometimes we're so busy about, no, you need to know the answer. And David kind of responds in that way. Look, hey, I, I'm not gonna, he doesn't see it right away. Because, you know, his mindset is not, not focused that way. He's, he's, not, he's not thinking all continually always about, uh, oh, man, you know, uh, Saul's trying to kill me and all these things. David has a pure mind about him. He has a pure sense of just trusting in God. He has a, his trust is being in the hands of the one who guided that stone to kill the giant. David's trust is in the God that gave him the strength to kill lions and bears and, and, and animals when they took the flock. That's who his trust is in. His trust is not in his own mindset or his own strength or his own intellect. Where's our trust at? Where, where is our trust? And if the enemy confronts you with a situation like this and your trust is in your own intellect, oh, I'm a smart Christian. I'll analyze this one. I got it covered. Then guess what? You'll be deceived. Because he uses that. If he, if he can cause you to analyze it yourself and you try to figure it out, he's got you. We need to trust the Lord. Put our trust in him. And he goes on to say, and let's move on here. But it came to pass at the time when Merib, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given unto Adriel the Meholathite to wife. And and what, what is this girl's name? Michelle. Make, how do you say it? Somebody? Michael? All right, you said it. And, and Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. And Saul said, I will give him her, that she may be a snare to him, and that the hand of the Philistines may, may be against him. See, so now, David, let's, let's kind of step out of here for a second. David's getting the, he's probably sitting there going, wait a minute. Uh, first of all, you, you're the king, and you told me, that I was supposed to marry your oldest daughter. And first of all, I should have married her a long time ago because I killed that giant back then. And now you're telling me, you go and let her get married to somebody else, and now I get this other daughter named Michael, okay, and I got to marry her now. What's going on here? Why, why, what's going on with you, Saul? Why are you changing up on me here? I mean, he could have at some point said, no, this is rightfully mine. What's happening? See, the enemy likes to confuse situations so much, man. He, he likes to get in there, and, and not only is his intent for you to die, because the Bible tells us he's out to destroy your life and your walk with God, but he likes to mix things up on us, make change, bring, a, bring about something different, to, that we could get in a place where we're confused, or we could get into an area where we're going, what's happening here? Uh, you know, what, the Bible tells me this, you know, I'm supposed to be an inheritance of the, you know, a, a child of the inheritance, you know, whatever that means. The Bible says I'm supposed to be victorious in Jesus. I, I'm supposed to have all this, this victory in my life, but then yet I fail all the time. Or yet, you know, 
uh, none of these things that I'm reading, or I see in this other brother taking place, he's all being used by God. Everybody loves him, but everybody makes fun of me. You know, and you see this, and the enemy likes to get you to a point where you're, you're, allowing, where you're allowing your situation of change to get you all weirded out. And that's where David is just, his mindset is totally set in another place. He says, wherefore Saul said to David, thou shalt this day be my son-in-law and the one of the twain. See, 1 Peter 5, 8 says that we need to be sober-minded. We need to be watchful. Because our adversary, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking to devour. See, his intention for us as Christians is not no one. If the enemy had his way, every single one of us in, in this room, our lives would be, a, he would set a, get involved in our lives in such a way that he would destroy all of our walks with God. Over in uh, Psalms chapter 37, it's, a, it's an interesting verse. It says in verse 12, the wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. See, this is the enemy's MO. It always remains this way. Plot against the just. Those of you in this room who are trying to live a righteous life, guess what? He is plotting against you. It's no wonder why you're confused. Don't, don't find that to be a mystery. If maybe you're sitting here wondering what God's doing in your life, Maybe you're one sitting here going, you know, I don't know exactly what's going to come of this situation of mine. I don't know what's going to happen with my future. We don't know our future. See, but it's, but it's recognized in the scripture that the wicked, they plot against the just. See, the enemy has this, this incentive. He has it out for you. But look at what the psalm says in the rest of that, in verse 13. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. You see, even though the enemy is constantly about trying to bring plots against you as a Christian man, and many of us know the list of what this plot looks like. It's everything from temptation, it's lust, it's, it's women, it's money. Some of us, it's our pride, anger issues. You've been through 17 anger classes and you still got it. You know, some of us, it's, it's so many different things, but the enemy is nonstop about plotting. He's nonstop about getting in your mind about this stuff. He doesn't quit, you see. He doesn't quit. This is the message. The enemy doesn't quit about messing with your mind and messing with your walk with God. This is his purpose. It's what he's for. It's why he's among this earth right now, to destroy and to deceive Christian men from being victorious in the Lord. And he does it by plotting. You guys know what a plot is. It's being mischievous. It's sitting in the background going, hmm, what can I do here in this person's life just to destroy it? And I'll wait, and I'll study this person, and I'll figure out what his weakness is. I'll figure, some of us don't struggle with women. Some of us don't struggle with finances. We're all different. But the enemy will sit back and he'll pay attention to you. And he'll learn your ways. He'll see what actually gets you all fired up. Ooh, I know what gets that guy fired up. You know, I know, I know how to get this person to just, it's like I was talking to somebody today. Um, it's like our wives, okay? Not that the enemies are wives, but <laughs> my wife is the only person who can fire me up like in a second. And I don't understand how. I don't understand how. It's, it's one, she, she knows what to say. She's the only one, too. There's a lot of guys, I've been called names, made fun of. Uh, all kinds of things as a Christian, even to this day. And I'm whatever, man, you know, make fun of me, okay, ooh, you know, whatever. I'm short, we get what you always say, I'm short, whatever, okay. Well, I never heard that one. You know, and, but my wife, she can say something, man, and I'll just burn. <laughs> Picture all kinds of stuff in my head. I don't even know how I start talking about this. Give <laughs> me my wife. Okay. We're chilling, getting me all fired up, man. Look at me. I'm getting fired up right now, dude. My <laughs> goodness. Man, I need to swap. <laughs> wow, talk about a tangent. Temptation. The enemy knows how to push our buttons. He knows how to push our buttons. And he waits, and he learns you. 
Don't think you're exempt from that. Don't think you're exempt from that. He, he learns us. And he waits like a lion. You guys watch those National Geographic. Here, I go on another tangent. You know, where, where them, they're really cool to watch, when, especially the ones about lions. Because you start to picture Satan, you know. And these things are sitting there. And they, they, these lions use one another. And they're coming this way, and one's running this way, and another one's way over here. They got, it's almost like they're, they're, they got, they're in an army, you know, and they're setting the stage up, and boom, when it's time to move in, they move in. And that's why the Bible identifies Satan as a roaring lion, because he does the same thing. He's cunning, plotting against you. Don't be surprised when change comes about. Don't be surprised when, what you, when, when you think, man, but I was supposed to be victorious in that. I thought I was supposed to be delivered in that. Why do I keep stumbling from that? Why do I keep on falling in the same trap? But I was supposed to, David was supposed to have the wife already. I was supposed to marry her when I killed Goliath. And, and now I'm going through all this jazz still. And as a Christian, we say, but I thought Jesus died on the cross for me. I thought he forgave me of my sins. I thought I'm supposed to have all this power as a Christian. And I'm still struggling with porn. Or I'm still struggling with this. Or I'm still struggling with that. I thought I was supposed to be victorious. The victorious Christian, you know, man. See, you are victorious. You are victorious. You are. You do have all the power that, that raised Jesus from, from earth to heaven. It, it dwells. It's in us too. We have that same power. But the enemy is tricky. Tricky enough to convince some men in this room that you don't have the power to overcome those things. And that's the plot. That's the lion. And he waits. And he waits just now he can convince one of us in this room that you aren't victorious and you can't overcome that. That's just you. You're just a messed up one out of the seeds. You're just the grape that's, you know, purple and all the other ones are red. You're just the one that's messed up. You're the bad raisin, the black sheep. You're the one that can't do it. I remember feeling that way. I struggled with something for a time as a Christian. And I remember convincing myself Maybe I'm just different. <laughs> maybe I, maybe I, I'm just one of them guys that can't get over that, man. I hated that feeling, man. It's a deception. So, verse 22. <clears throat> and Saul commanded his servants. And now look at Because all this image stuff, this imagery, this, you know, this whole thing about the enemy plotting and stuff, it eventually it comes out in words. And now, he's, now Saul's beginning to, to, he's plotting, we all know that already. But now he's going to give some direction to his servants. And look what he says. He commanded his servants saying, Now go commune with David secretly. Oh, I hate that word, secretly. Because what's done in secret, God says, is shouted out from the rooftops. I hate the word secret. Because it's those moments. When, when those quiet moments. You know, when nobody else is around. It's, hey, bro. <coughs> That's the enemy. He loves to use this, this, uh, this, these whispers, you know, in the dark kind of thing. And so he's saying, go talk to him secretly, man. Just on the down. Behold. And say, behold, the king hath delight in thee. He said, go tell David I like him. Tell him the king has delight in him. Wait a minute. We already know Saul's heart. Saul hates him. He wants him dead. See, Satan hates you. He wants you dead. But if he can use something to make it appear as if it's good for you, to make it appear as if it likes you. Pastor Jeff always talks about, you know, and he says all the time, it's kind of funny, the, 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 the guy, the Christian guy who, who's, you know, you got this bombshell of a girl type who wants you and you look in the mirror, you're like this old guy, you're losing your hair like me and all these things. And, you know, Satan wants to appear that, that it likes you. It likes you. She likes you, man. You know, or this situation is going to be good for you. See, Saul's telling him, tell him. Tell him in secret that I really like him. It's not true. As a reader, we know that's a lie straight from hell. He's not telling the truth. But he wants David to be convinced that he actually likes him. Why? And I always say this so he can draw him close to him. Oh, how the enemy would love you close to him. How he would love it if you were in his camp. To draw that, the, the Sunday school story of the sheep, you know, and they're all together and the one that wanders off and the wolf comes and, and eats them or whatever. That's exactly what he wants to do. He'll draw you away into you thinking that you're, you're pursuing after something that actually likes you. 
Something that's actually going to be good for you. Something that actually made a connection with you. And, and that's where you get those stories of those people who, a lot of guys who I know today who are hooked on drugs, and all of a sudden they meet an old friend who's doing good too, and they're all grown up, and, and, but yet that person's not a Christian, and you guys start hanging out, all of a sudden we're all, man, good times, yearbook times, you know, all this stuff, and all of a sudden, uh, let's do a line. What? All right, and boom, there you go. The enemy uses all these real life situations to draw you in. Let's go clubbing. Oh yeah, good dance, like the old days. What? <laughs> Those weren't the old days. You're, you're moving on now. You're a Christian. You're growing in the Lord. You're, you're moving forward in life. Don't be deceived into thinking, oh, the old days were good. Come on. Let's go club him. We still got him. Going in there, you guys are the 40-year-olds. Everybody else is like 15. <laughs> but you still got it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but now you're, you're caught, you see. It's real for some people. You're caught all of a sudden. And you're going, what the heck am I doing here, man? Well, you got a little umbrella and everything. What are you doing here? <laughs> the old days. He wants to draw us in. And, and now Saul's trying to bring him, tell him I like him. And it says that his servants, and, and all his servants love thee. Look at that. Now, therefore, be the king's son-in-law. I love you, David. I like you. Come on into my family. Come on. Join, join the, the Saul family. Be my son -in -law. Join the enemy's team. Get off that track. Get off that victory. Get off that God team. Come back on our team. And he's going to use whatever he can. And Saul, in this point, is trying to use uh, this weird situation to do it. So look at <clears throat> Verse 23. And Saul's servants spake those words in the ears of David. And David said, Seemeth it to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law? Seeing that I'm a poor man and lightly esteemed. Same thing. Remember, he said that before. And the servants of Saul told him, saying, On this manner spake David. So they went and told Saul. And now look at Saul's going to come back with another thing to say. And Saul said, Thus shall you say to David, The king desireth not any dowry, but a hundred foreskins of the Philistines, to be avenged of the king's enemies. See, look at notice what the king's doing now. He, he's saying, he's almost saying a, a, a mixed point here. He's saying, I'm not, I'm not asking for, for anything. But at the same time, I do want something. Send him to the Philistines. Now this is, now the, the enemies, now Saul's purpose for all of this is getting closer, isn't it? Because his whole purpose of all this was to do what? Get David to go to the Philistines, that way they could kill him. So it's getting closer and closer to that. It's, he's drawing him closer to exa exactly what he wanted to do. But interesting how the enemy is, is also using this, this thought of, look, tell, give David a reason then. Because David's a warrior. He, he's a strong guy. He, he, he has purpose in him. And, and Saul's saying, well, have him then. Tell him that I really want then him to go kill all these Philistines. Tell him to get to work. Tell him to be busy about something. See, and this is a real, real scary point for a lot of Christians today. Where the enemy starts to convince you that, you, you can work your way. Or he's going to give you now something to do. Be, be busy about what I want you to do. Man, how many of us Christians, even ourselves, have fallen under this, this web? Where you start, you start working for the Lord. And you start getting caught up in the works aspect of it. And you start thinking you're justified and you're clean and you're, you're covered by the blood of the Lamb based upon how much you can do at church. It doesn't help that you got so many... Uh, others saying you got to do this and do that and get involved and get involved all the time. And then you get caught up in this, oh, that's what I can do. I can work for the Lord. I can get busy. I can, I can, I can show God, you know, by, by what I do. That's one deception the enemy has. One huge deception today in our, in our society today is Christians believing that they can actually do so much by their hands that it's going to please God. See, God, he already said it through his word so many times. I don't need your, your sacrifices. I don't need all your works. I just need your obedience. I just want your heart. I just want you to love. I want to love you. I want you to love me. I don't need you to work your way to me. I already paid the price. I already won the victory. But God intervenes. Because don't get me wrong, I've been there. I was serving here seven days a week. You know, doing all kinds of crazy things. But God, when he knows our hearts. 
And he knows that the enemy tries to be tricky and gets you caught up. But God's faith will come in, in right in the middle of it and slow you down a little bit. And sometimes maybe that's what he's doing with some of us right now. Just slow you down a little bit. Get some perspective here. Don't get caught up in, the, in this thing that the church of Ephesians, uh, the Ephesus church got caught up in. He says, I know your works and I know all that you do, but hey, you're losing your first love. I say that all the time. And a lot of times that can happen with us today. And he brings you back and he says, hey, don't get caught up in that. And, this is, and he kind of does it for David here. And he goes on to say, oh, let me finish verse 25. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. And again, his motive hasn't changed, has it? Just because his appearance is looking all these different ways and these changes and all these different things he's asking David to do, his motive is still the same. He wants him to die. Gosh, we gotta, we got to engrave that in our minds, isn't it? We have to make sure that we solidify, even tonight or some other time, maybe some of you have already, that the enemy just wants to destroy you. That's it. Don't be deceived that he has another plan for you. And when his servants told David these words, it pleased David. David was a worker, man. Well to be the king, it, it pleased him. David, well to be the king's son-in-law, and the days were not expired. And look at verse 27. It says, Wherefore David arose, and he went, he and his men, he went after this, this new objective that was given to him by the king, and he slew of the Philistines 200 men. What is this saying to us? See, the enemy is continually working on David at this point. Saul's working on him in every way, shape, or form. And sometimes many of us fall into this. We, we, can, we can be deceived by the enemy. I'm not just sitting here trying to introduce all these different things and ideas just to make fun of it. Because many of us, we have been drawn into the enemy. We have, that's why some of us are here. We need God's word to continue to come inside us to give us strength and wisdom. See, we have been sucked in, man, and we have been deceived, but God is faithful. And, and, and now look at David. It says that he, he slew not only 100, he slew 200 of these Philistines. You see, we have to remember that God wants to prove something to every single one of us. Just when we think we're meeting him right where we need to be, he shows you that he can empower you to do even two times more than what you think. He shows you that he can empower you to be something way more than what the enemy's trying to cause you to believe is, is a necessity or required. Saul's trying to cause David to believe that this is a necessity. This is required of you right now from me. And then God goes and shows David that, look, David, because you're walking with me, because you behave yourself wisely, because you're a man after my own heart, I will give you victory even more so, two times more. The enemy in his ploy and his plot has nothing on you at all. So as long as you keep your eyes fixed on me, you keep your heart set on me. See, David had to learn this lesson for his entire future that was coming. Sadly, there were times where he forgot it. But he, if, he had to learn at this point that if he kept his eyes fixed on the Lord, his victory, his power in God, God would even, as the enemy is drawing him and attempting to deceive him, God would even give him victory two times more over what the enemy's plot was. See, because the enemy's plot and his deception and his work that he tries to bring in, in, in about in our lives can be smashed on by the power of God through what you're doing in your life. See, even though you think, oh, man, I got caught up. I, I got deceived. But what does it mean so much more for a man who got deceived, for a man who went after it, took the bait, but for a man to overcome and come out of it? What kind of testimony is that? How much more does that say to the world around you, to you? It sets a marker in you that you'll never forget. Even though I got caught up, even though I was messing around, even though the enemy tricked me, man, God gave me victory. And God, God actually, I learned so much more out of that. Because the Bible says what the enemy means for evil, God turns around for what? Good. For good. We have to remember these things. The enemy's after you constantly, but you know what? Okay, fine. You recognize it, you know it, you're aware of it, but that doesn't mean that Jesus is all of a sudden a little bit hiding behind you. Oh, watch it, the enemy's over there. No, Jesus is still standing strong, fully glorified, saying, I'm, I have given you victory already. The price has been paid. See, that's what we have to remember. Don't be on that. that don't be on that deceptive road where you're just constantly kind of going, oh, oh, man, what's happening? Oh, I'm back and forth. I'm going to church tonight. Oh, I'll go next month, too. No, stand in the victory. Stand. Let Jesus put him in front and say, this is my victory. <clears throat> I, I, can, I have messed up, but because of him, I will overcome because I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. I'm not more than a conqueror through my own mind. 
I'm not more than a conqueror through my own ways and my own, in my own ways of thinking. I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. And he goes on to say, And David brought their foreskins. He gave them in full, tail to the king, that he might be the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him Michael, his daughter, to wife. Even though, I mean, now David has done above and beyond for that. That should have been his way back then after he slew Goliath. But here it is now, finally taking place. And Saul saw and knew the Lord was with David, and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was yet the more afraid of David, and Saul became David's enemy continually. Then the princes of the Philistines went forth, and it came to pass after they went forth that what? Here we go again. That David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was much set by. See, David, he experienced the good, he experienced the bad, he experienced the roller coaster, he experienced the whackness of Saul, the mind trips of Saul, the, 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 the deception of Saul. He saw God's power still intervene for his life. He, and now we see two sides of it here. Now Saul on one end is more afraid of David. He's going, man, this guy, what is it gonna take? For me to destroy this, this kid, man. Why can't I just kill the guy? I just I try to send him out to Philistines. I couldn't even kill him that way. You see, this is a picture of the victory that we have today. Guys, we're going to heaven. For those of you in this room who have received Jesus in your heart, as your Lord and your Savior, you confess him with your heart and you believe him, you're going to heaven. That's not going to change. You see what I'm saying? That's not going to change. So as long as you live a life seeking after God, seeking after his righteousness every day, that's not going to change. You're going to mess up. Yeah, you are. I mess up. You're going to, we're going to sometimes get drug in and deceived. That's going to happen. We're not perfect. You're going to slip. I slip. I went clubbing, dude. I was the one with the umbrella. Drink. <laughs> I, you know, you get caught up. The point is... Jesus doesn't go, oh, man, no, I'm sorry, man. I got to take my blood away from you, and I'm no longer going to cleanse you and all these things. No, the, the price has been paid. See, we're going to heaven. That's such a good thought. Just to think that, man, when this life is over, all the drama in this life, man, all the drama of families and, and, and hurt and disappointments and, and work, and this, the, for, you guys know what I'm saying, the the striving of work, God, goodness, can't wait till it's over. <laughs> you know, just being able to go, I'm spending eternity with the Lord. And that, see, for every single one of us in here, that's our inheritance. It doesn't change. And the enemy hates it. And he knows it to be true. And that's why it says that Saul was just so much more afraid of David. He's like, I can't mess with this guy. He's the anointed. He has the anointing of the Spirit of God on him. So do we. We have that anointing. The Spirit of God is upon us. And in all this, again, going back to finishing this chapter, this is a chapter that says, really, David behaved himself wisely in all situations. He behaved himself in such a way that was looked at by God as a wise way to behave. He, did, he, didn't, he didn't get off the roller coaster. But notice, he, lived, he behaved himself wisely because he moved in the authority and in the power of God. And that's the only way we're going to be able to do it, guys. As we ask the Lord to, to continue to empower us with his Holy Spirit, that's how we're going to be able to behave ourselves. Well. We're not going to be able to do it in our own strength. We're not going to be able to all of a sudden, oh, I'm strong, and I'm all watching me do this now. Honey, I'm behaving myself wisely. No, it's going to be something where we have to say, Lord, give me the strength to be able to behave. With. Let me live in the victory, because in that victory is how we're going to be able to maintain our composure as Christians. And to be able to glorify the Lord. It's in his strength. Not yours. It's in his mindset, in his ways, in his principles. Not yours. Give it back to him. Let him be the author of our faith. And what? The finisher of it. Isn't it? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for your victory again, Lord. It seems like the more we talk about David and the more we um, talk about just seeing his interaction with Saul, the more we end with a conclusion of saying your victory, not ours. 
And Lord, it seems like a message that no matter what the story is, no matter what the account is, it always goes back to you. <laughs> it always goes back to you being the one that paid the price for us. And you're not asking us for anything, to, for us to be working for you, for us to be the ones that are going to come to this point where we have the power. So, Lord, as we make decisions here, because we know we have to, that we would make them in, in having the wisdom that you give to us, and that we make them in the, in, with the authority and your power, by your spirit, not, not by our might or not by our strength, but by your spirit. So that's why we ask tonight, even, Lord, that you would continue to fill us with that, that we can go forth to be victorious, even in situations and life brings changes and things just don't look right and the enemy's constantly lying and, and trying to bring us into this web. You're still victorious. It's not our strength. So go before us for the rest of this night. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.